municipalities such as this. That's Mr. G. Edward Griffin. Ed well, thank you, Mike, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know how to take that remark about uh, <laughs> age. You know, when Bill Jasper stands up and they announce him as the senior editor for the magazine, I know I'm in trouble. <laughs> Well, we have a lot of material to cover, so I think I'll just sort of jump into this as quickly as possible. I need to warn you about something, though. Uh, since this is being videotaped tonight, and we have um, a limitation on the length of the time on the videotapes, I have been instructed to, uh, to divide this into two parts. Uh, the first part will last approximately 45 or 50 minutes long, and then we'll take a short break, I'm told, while they change tapes. And the next part we deliver next month. <laughs> no, no, there are just a few minutes break and then we'll continue with part two. So I want you to know that's coming up. So, okay, now to the topic. <sighs> are you ready for this? Okay, so am I. So let's start with history. We'll go back to the first century BC to a tiny kingdom called Phrygia. And it was in that kingdom that there lived a philosopher by the name of Epictetus. And it was Epictetus who said, Appearances are of four kinds. Things either are as they appear to be, or they neither are nor appear to be. Or they are, but do not appear to be, or they are not, and yet appear to be. <laughs> Don't worry, no quiz on that. <laughs> Well, that's what he said. When I read that statement for the first time, I thought to myself that uh, surely if Epictetus were alive today, he would undoubtedly be a Harvard professor of money and banking. <laughs> <laughs> because this is the kind of explanation we get, isn't it, when we try and figure out what's going on in the economy or what's going on with the Federal Reserve System. See, what Epictetus did is what is so commonly done with uh, the experts in this field is he took a relatively simple concept, but by the time he was through explaining it to us, we didn't have the foggiest idea what he's talking about. All he said, basically, was that appearances can sometimes be deceiving. That's all. We all know that. But he had to break it down into four component parts, explain that in two ways they are what they appear to be, and in other two ways they sometimes are not the way they appear to be, and they broke it down and we didn't understand what he's talking about. Nevertheless, I thought that this statement by Epictetus was uh, a brilliant uh, clue for an outline or a theme <coughs> for my presentation. Because, you know, if there's anything in the world that uh, is an appearance that is deceiving, it is the Federal Reserve System. And in particular, it is one of those appearances of the fourth kind, which, as I'm sure you all remember, <laughs> are those which are not and yet appear to be. So that's going to be my theme tonight. I'm going to come back to it now and then if I remember to do it and use it as kind of a punctuation point because this is perhaps at the most fundamental level the most important thing we need to know about the Federal Reserve System, which is that it is a, an appearance of the fourth kind, something which is not and yet appears to be. When I did my research on this topic, I came to the conclusion, which may startle you folks here, that the Federal Reserve System does not need to be audited. It needs to be abolished. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I say that is because I'm sure that if they audited the Federal Reserve System, they would find out that it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. There's no secret there. There's no shenanigan going on behind the scenes. It's all out in the open. If we'll just study the Federal Reserve System on the basis of what we know already, if we'll read their literature, if we'll dig into the history, we find out that it's one of the greatest scams of all history. Out on the surface, it doesn't need an audit. An audit, I'm sure, would merely delay the process for a couple of years, give the American people the false impression that something is being done about this problem, and at the end of two years they'd say, well, the books are clean. 
I came to the conclusion that the Federal Reserve needed to be abolished for seven reasons, actually, and I'd like to read them for you now. I've stated them in rather concise terms. Hopefully, they'll have some shock value so you can remember them. And here they are. First of all, it is incapable of accomplishing its stated objectives. Two, it is a cartel operating against the public interest. Three, it is the supreme instrument of usury. Four, it generates our most unfair tax. Five, it encourages war. Six, it destabilizes the economy. And seven, it is an instrument of totalitarianism. Now, I don't know what you think about those seven points. I know that a lot of you are uh, totally in agreement with it. I can tell by your reaction. I trust that there are some skeptics here tonight. I hope there are. Otherwise, I feel like the minister talking to the choir. Usually, there are skeptics in my audience. And frankly, those are the ones I'm most interested in talking to. And for the skeptics, I'm sure that you're thinking those sound like pretty far out statements. How could you ever demonstrate them to be true? But I think you would agree, regardless of your preliminary conclusion about those statements, that if any of them could be proven to be true, there would be good enough reason to abolish the Federal Reserve System. So let's take a look and see whether they can be supported. Time doesn't permit to go into all seven of those here this evening, but I would like to splash around on at least the first four of them to show you that indeed there is ample evidence to support these conclusions. And I think the best place to begin with all of this is where the action was, and that is the creation of the Federal Reserve System. And that takes us directly to the title of my book, The Creature from Jekyll Island. You can almost hear the music being played in the background as they do some kind of a spot commercial to sell this book. I, I have to admit I had a lot of fun with that title because I had this fantasy in my mind that some, someday it might be in a bookstore window and people would pass by and think, oh, it's a sequel to Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that will never happen, I'm sure. The fact of the matter is, for those of you who know uh, a little bit about this topic, the title has quite a bit of meaning in it. And we have a lot to learn by exploring what that meaning is. First of all, Jekyll Island is a real island. It's off the coast of Georgia. And it was on that island back in 1910 that the Federal Reserve System was conceived at a highly secret meeting that took place there. And what I'd like to do is talk about this meeting and show you that, in fact, the Federal Reserve was created there and that in, there was a lot of secrecy surrounding it. And then we'll be confronted with the question, why the secrecy? When things are done in secret, there are often things to hide. And we'll explore what it was that they wanted to hide. And when we finally understand what that was, we'll be face to face with one of the most important facts about the Federal Reserve System that is not generally known. In 1910, Jekyll Island was privately owned, owned by a small group of millionaires. In those days, they were millionaires. In today's dollars, they would be billionaires from New York. This is where their families went to spend the, the winter months. It was a resort. Island, a resort club. It was called the Jekyll Island Club. And there was a very elaborate clubhouse there, which was the center of their social activities. It's still there, by the way, if anybody wants to visit it. Uh, the island has been purchased by the state of Georgia, and this clubhouse has been uh, renovated. It's a beautiful thing. And uh, around this clubhouse, they had cottages, which were built by many of the families that belonged to the club. Uh, cottages are not exactly the word I would have chosen to describe these structures. I remember on taking the tour through one of them, the guide said that there were 14 bathrooms in that cottage. <laughs> so you have an idea of the kind of elegance that was there. In any event, the number of bathrooms has nothing to do with this story. I just get hung up on that because uh, 
It's hard for me to imagine a cottage with that many, that much running plumbing. But the important point was that this is where the Federal Reserve System was conceived, is in that clubhouse. So let's tell that story. It all began in November of 1910 when Senator Nelson Aldridge sent his private railroad car to the New Jersey Railroad Station where there it was in readiness for the arrival of himself and six other men who were instructed to come under conditions of great secrecy. For example, they were told to come one at a time, not to be seen together, not to dine together on the night of their departure. If they had arrived at the same time, they were instructed to pretend as though they didn't even know each other. They were to avoid newspaper reporters because these were well-known men and had they been spotted by reporters which often frequented the railroad station, especially had they been seen together, why, many questions would have been asked. One of the men carried a shotgun in a big black case so that if he had been asked where he was going, he was prepared to say that he was going on a duck hunting trip. And the interesting thing about that little piece of the history is that this man, we find out later from his biographer, never fired a gun in his life. He even had to borrow that shotgun in order to participate in this deception. Even after they got on board the railroad car, this pattern continued. They were told to use first names only, not to use last names. And two of the men adopted code names completely. The reason for that is that they were afraid that the servants on board the train would recognize who they were if they used their last names. And they knew that if word leaked out in that fashion and eventually found its way into the press, the whole purpose of the meeting would have been completely destroyed. So absolute secrecy was essential. Well, the train traveled for two nights and a day on a thousand mile journey to the south. And when they awoke on the second morning, the car was on the siding, the railroad siding at Brunswick, Georgia. And from there, they took the ferry boat across the Inland Strait to Jekyll Island and to the clubhouse. And for the next nine days, these men sat around a table and hammered out all the important details of what eventually became the Federal Reserve System. And incidentally, if you visit that clubhouse today, you can walk down to the end of the one corridor there, and on a door is a brass plaque. And it says, in this room, the Federal Reserve System was created. When they were done, they got back on board the train, back to New York, and disappeared. And for quite a few years after that, these men denied that any such meeting ever took place. It wasn't until after the Federal Reserve was firmly established that only then did they begin to talk openly about it. They wrote books on it. One of them wrote a magazine article, and they gave interviews to newspaper reporters. And so now, many years later, it's possible for us to go to the public record and find in print detailed uh, descriptions of what happened at that meeting. Well, who were these men? The first one I've already mentioned, the one with the railroad car, Senator Nelson Aldridge, who was the Republican whip in the Senate. He was also chairman of the National Monetary Commission, which was that special committee of Congress which was created for the purpose of proposing legislation which was to reform banking. That was the idea. Banking needed reform. And the American people were greatly concerned in those days over things that were going on in the banking industry. People were losing their money in the banks because they weren't keeping their promises to hold their deposits in reserve. There were runs on the bank and the banks couldn't pay the people back. But most of all, they were concerned over the concentration of financial power that was in the hands of a small group of very powerful and large banks in New York on Wall Street. This is what they called the Money Trust. That was the name. And it was a very popular expression in the newspapers. And quite a few politicians 
were elected to office on their campaign promise to break the grip of the money trust. President Wilson was one of those politicians, by the way. So, that was the purpose of the National Monetary Commission, which was to propose legislation, which eventually became the Federal Reserve Act, to break the grip of the money trust over the financial markets of America. Aldridge was a business associate of J.P. Morgan. He was the father-in-law to John D. Rockefeller, Jr., which means, of course, that eventually he became the grandfather of Nelson Rockefeller, our former vice president. You remember his full name was Nelson Aldridge Rockefeller, so he derived his middle name from his famous grandfather. The second person at the meeting was Abraham Piat Andrew, who was Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. He later became a congressman, but he was very prominent in banking circles. Frank Vanderlip was there. He was the president of the National City Bank of New York, which was the largest and the most powerful of all the banks in the country. Representing the financial interests of William Rockefeller and the international <coughs> investment firm of Kuhn Loeb and Company. Henry Davison was there. He was the senior partner of the J.P. Morgan Company. Charles Norton was present. He was the president of the First National Bank of New York, which was another one of the giants. Also, there was Benjamin Strong, who was the head of J.P. Morgan's Bankers Trust Company. And incidentally, three years later, when the Federal Reserve System was finally created, he became the first head of the system. And finally, there was Paul Warburg, who was probably the most important of all the men there because of his knowledge of banking as it was practiced in Europe. Paul Warburg was born in Germany. He eventually became a naturalized American citizen. He was a partner in Kuhn Loeb and Company. He was a representative of the Rothschild banking dynasty in England and France. And through all the years of his banking in America, he remained uh, in very close contact with his brother, Max Warburg, who was the head of the Warburg <laughs> Banking Consortium in Germany and the Netherlands. Paul Warburg was one of the wealthiest men in the world. And those of you who are Little Orphan Annie fans, you'll remember Daddy Warbucks? Well, Paul Warburg was the real Daddy Warbucks, after whom that character was named. And everyone at the time knew it. I have his photograph in the book. If you'd like to compare his picture to the drawing rendition of Daddy Warbucks, you'll see the similarity between Warbucks and Warburg. Uh, and also, while we're on the subject of cartoon characters, anyone who's played Monopoly will remember the drawing of the capitalist with the handlebar mustache and the cigar. That's J.P. Morgan. Those are the seven men who were on Jekyll Island. And, and as incredible as it may seem, they represented approximately one-fourth of the wealth of the entire world. And these are the men that sat around a table on Jekyll Island and created the Federal Reserve System. What's going on here? Should arouse our curiosity a little bit. It didn't just happen. Well, speaking of it just happening, for the skeptics, you're probably wondering, did it really happen that way? Perhaps Griffin is exaggerating this to make a point. Well, yes, it really happened that way, and to illustrate that, we could go to a lot of documentation, but to simplify this, I'd like to just read for you a short excerpt taken from one article, one article written by Frank Vanderlip, who was one of the attendees at that meeting. And this was uh, written in, uh, in the Saturday Evening Post, and it appeared on February 9, 1935. And this is what Vanderlip said. I do not feel it is any exaggeration to speak of our secret expedition to Jekyll Island as the occasion of the actual conception of what eventually became the Federal Reserve System. We were told to leave our last names behind us. We were told further that we should avoid dining together on the night of our departure. We were instructed to come one at a time and as unobtrusively as possible 
to the railroad terminal on the New Jersey littoral of the Hudson, where Senator Aldridge's private car would be in readiness, attached to the rear end of a train to the south. Once aboard the private car, we began to observe the taboo that had been fixed on last names. We addressed one another as Ben, Paul, Nelson, and Abe. Davison and I adopted even deeper disguises, abandoning our first name. <coughs> On the theory that we were always right, he became Wilbur and I became Orville, <laughs> after those two aviation pioneers, the Wright brothers. The servants and train crew may have known the identities of one or two of us, but they did not know all, and it was the names of all printed together that would have made our mysterious journey significant in Washington, in Wall Street, even in London. Discovery, we knew, simply must not happen. Well, why? What's the big deal here? What's wrong with a group of bankers getting together in private and talking about banking or banking legislation? <coughs> and the answer to that question is provided by Vanderlip himself in the same article. He said, if it were to be exposed publicly that our particular group had got together and written a banking bill, that bill would have no chance whatever of passage by Congress. Why not? Because the purpose of the bill was to break the grip of the money trust. And ladies and gentlemen, it was written by the money trust. It's as simple as that. Had that fact been known from the very beginning, the public would never have accepted it as a means of breaking the grip over the money trust. And we would never have had a Federal Reserve System because the scam would have been exposed from the beginning. This was like having the fox build the hen house and install the security system. <laughs> so there is a primary reason for the secrecy. And it's a fact that most Americans have not even considered that there might have been some kind of deception, massive deception at the very inception of the Federal Reserve System and for a very good reason. But there's more to it than that, a lot more than that. Consider the composition of this group and the financial powers they represented. Is there anything strange about that mixture? Here we had the Rockefellers, uh, we had the Morgans, Kuhn Loeb and Company, the Rothschilds, the Warburgs, all in one room for nine days plus two days on the train, coming to an agreement. What's going on here? Well, anything strange about that mixture? Well, ladies and gentlemen, these were competitors. <coughs> these were the giants in the field which prior to this period had been beating their heads against each other for dominance in the marketplace, for dominance in the financial markets of the world, not only New York, but Paris and London, everywhere. Competitors. This is extremely significant because it happened at precisely that point of American history when business was undergoing a major ideological transition. Prior to this period, America had grown and prospered and surpassed all the countries of Europe as an industrial and economic power because it adhered to the principle of free enterprise competition. And it was in this period that a rapid transition was taking place to the concept of monopoly and cartel. Going back, in fact, to the old world concept which had held Europe back for all these years. <coughs> Monopolies and cartels were becoming the order of the day in America. It was John D. Rockefeller I who said it. He said, competition is a sin. He believed it. All of his biographers quote him on that one, by the way. And he and others of these industrialists of the period were devoting all of their time to the elimination of competition. They did not believe in free enterprise competition at all. They knew that the road to, rich, the road to riches and power was through the elimination of their competition. And if they couldn't beat their competition out, then they tried to buy them up. If that didn't work, they joined with them in a shared monopoly, and that is a cartel, a shared monopoly. 
Perhaps I should define that word in more detail so at least you'll know what I'm talking about when I use the word. A cartel is a group of independently owned businesses which come together for the purpose of reducing or eliminating competition between themselves so that they can enhance their profit margins or secure their position in the marketplace. And they do this by price fixing. They won't compete on price. Or they divide up geographical markets or products and services. For example, if we were forming a cartel here, I might say, well, I get the north and you get the south. We won't compete. Or I might insist that I get to produce the gizmo, but you can produce the widget. And we won't compete. Or we'll share patents and processes. We won't compete. And every time we agree to eliminate one area of competition between ourselves, we move closer and closer together until finally we are as one industry insofar as the marketplace is concerned, even though our component parts are independently owned. And that is a cartel. And so that enhances our profits. We can get more for our products and services than we could in the arena of free enterprise competition. And of course, the other side of that coin is that the public pays more for those products or services than they would otherwise. And that is just as true in a banking cartel as it is in any other kind of cartel. And the amazing fact emerges that when you study this period, that for the 15 years before the meeting on Jekyll Island, these groupings of which we're speaking had come together increasingly in joint ventures. They were learning how to avoid competition between themselves. They knew they couldn't knock each other out. They had tried that. It was too costly. Now it was time to come together. And what happened on Jekyll <coughs> Island is that they formed a banking cartel, and they called it the Federal Reserve System. An amazing fact that all these years we've had something which most people have thought was a government operation of some kind or another. It was, we were told it was a creation to protect the people, to stabilize the economy, and it's a cartel. And the purpose of a cartel is to enhance the profit structure of the members of the cartel, period. That's the second amazing discovery to be learned if we understand and analyze what happened on Jekyll Island back in 1910. But there's a third element which is perhaps even the most important of all, and that is that this cartel went into partnership with the government. Well, cartels often do that to enforce their cartel agreements, but in this case they did it in spades. Now, in any partnership, there has to be a payoff. There has to be some benefit to the partners, otherwise they won't go into the partnership, or if they go into it, they won't stay in it for very long. So it's a legitimate question for us to ask, what is the payoff? What's the benefit to these partners? Let's find out why the government is in this partnership, and then we'll find out why the banking cartel is in it. And in order to find out what the payoff is, we'll have to examine how the Federal Reserve System creates money, because that's the key. Now, if you're not familiar with how money is created in America, this is going to be really s some experience to go through this. For the first time, you're going to shake your heads and say, I don't believe this. I call it the Mandrake Mechanism, after that 1940s comic book character, Mandrake the Magician and create something out of nothing, wave his cape, and it was back into the void again. That's the Federal Reserve System. Now, let's take this and break this down. I, I need to warn you in advance, however, that you shouldn't try and make sense out of this. Because okay? <laughs> you'll blow a fuse if you think this makes sense. Just remember, this is your plain old American scam that we're talking about here. It's that simple. And I'm going to strip away all of the banker terminology and all the accounting terminology and use just plain old plotting English to make it comprehensible. In spite of that, however, I want you to know that everything I'm going to tell you from a technical point of view is 100% accurate in spite of the simplicity of the language. 
Okay. With that by way of preliminary, let's get right to the mandrake mechanism itself. It starts with the government side of the partnership. It starts in Congress. When Congress is spending money far and beyond what it takes in in taxes. How can Congress spend more money than its income in taxes? Basically what happens is the Congress goes down to the Treasury and asks for, let's say it's a billion dollars more that they need this day. And the Treasury official says, you guys got to be kidding, we don't have any money here. You spent it all long ago. Everything we've taken in taxes is long spent. And Congress says, well, we kind of figured that was the case, but we thought somebody might have dropped by and left some money. <laughs> they said, we know what we'll do. We'll borrow the rest of it. So they go down the street to the printing office. Now notice they're not going to print money. They're going to print certificates, nice big fancy certificates with borders on the corner and a, an eagle at the top and a seal at the bottom, and it'll say United States Treasury Bond or note, or bill, depending on the length of maturity. And it's so impressive, it almost looks like money. But if you hold it up to light, it really says, I owe you. That's all they are. And so Congress takes it, and it wants the public to step forward and loan them money in exchange for the IOUs. Sometimes that's called buying bonds. No. You're not buying anything. You're loaning money to the government and getting an IOU in return. And a lot of people in the private sector and institutions are anxious to loan money to the government. Why? Because they have heard that it's the best investment you can possibly make, the most secure investment, because it is backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. <laughs> And that, people aren't quite sure what that means, but it sure sounds good. And so they lend the money. Well, just in, in case there's anyone here in doubt as to what that means, I'd like to explain it to you. The full faith and credit of the United States government means that the federal government solemnly promises to pay you back your money plus interest if it has to take everything you've got in the form of taxes to do it, it will do it. <laughs> it's a promise to tax you. And people don't think this thing through. They think, oh, it's wonderful. It's a, it's a you know, wonderful investment, and I'm going to get some of my money back. Anyway, that's a little side issue. The government is able to borrow a tremendous amount of money and therefore spend more than it takes in in taxes <coughs> through this process. But never enough. They always need more than that. Not to worry, they say. They walk further down the street to the Federal Reserve Building. Now the Fed has been waiting for them. That's one of the reasons it was created. And they walk in there and the Federal Reserve officer opens up his desk drawer, pulls out a big checkbook. And he writes a check to the United States Treasury for one billion dollars and hands it to them. Now we need to stop and ask a question. Where did they get that money? A billion dollars, that's a lot of money. Who put the money in that, that, into that account for the Federal Reserve so they could give it to Congress or to the Treasury? And the answer is there is no money there. There's absolutely zero. There's just a checkbook. Well, if you and I were to do that, we would go to jail. <coughs> but they can do it because Congress wants them to do it. This, in fact, is the payoff. This is the benefit to the government for being in the partnership. The government can go to the Federal Reserve and <coughs> obtain instant amounts of any amount of money they want without having to confront the taxpayer and say, we're going to raise your taxes for this money directly. It would be very unpopular if Congress had to go to the public and say, you know, we have a lot of money we want to take from you folks, and it's going to cost you $3,000 per family more than it did last year. You know how long they'd last in office. So they like this mandrake mechanism very well. The public doesn't know that it's costing them anything. It's just how it works somehow. So this money, this billion dollars, springs into being precisely at the instant 
that the Federal Reserve officer signs the check and gives it to the governor. Now let's see where the banking cartel benefits from this partnership. We'll go back to that billion dollar check and follow it. The Treasury official deposits it into the checking account of the federal government. And immediately all the computers start to whir and the ledgers show that the government now has a billion dollar deposit, a billion dollars in its account, and so therefore it can write checks up to a billion dollars government checks start flowing. Let's just follow a $100 check. Make this real simple to the fellow that delivers our mail. The postal worker gets a $100 check. And he looks at this and he can't imagine in his wildest dreams that just two days ago that money didn't exist anywhere in the universe. But it's a government check now and it's very spendable. So he takes it and deposits it into his private checking account at the local commercial bank. Now this money is out of the Federal Reserve mechanism per se, out of the government side of the partnership, and it gets into the private banking side of the partnership. A hundred dollars has been deposited. And now the action heats up. The banker looks at that and he goes over to the loan window and he opens it up and he says, attention everybody, we have money to loan. And that's good news for a lot of people because that's one of the reasons we go to the bank, isn't it? To borrow money. So it's good news when there's money available. And the banker says, we have $100 deposited, but don't worry folks, we can loan you more than that. We can loan you up to $900. Well, how? How can you loan out up to $900 when you only have $100 deposited? Well, it's not difficult if you're in the Federal Reserve System. Here's how it works. The Federal Reserve says that the member banks must keep no less than 10% of their deposits in reserve. So there's $100. They keep 10% in reserve, $10. And they can loan up to $90, right? So we loan it to you, ma'am. You borrowed $90. What do you do with it? Well, you want to spend it. So you want to write a check on it. You've deposited it into your checking account so you can write a check. In many cases, it might be put directly into your checking account. But now there's $90 deposit. In addition to the $100 that was deposited to start this chain, now we've got the $90 that was loaned as another deposit. Well, the Federal Reserve says that you only have to keep 10%, so we keep 10% of the 90 and loan the other 90%, and the person that borrows that puts it right back into the bank as another deposit. Well, the Federal Reserve says you only have to keep 10%, so you do, you know, this goes around and around and around to the revolving door until finally the whole action is played out, and the bottom line is when that $100 deposit comes in from the postal worker, the banks, in essence, can loan up to $900 because $100 is the reserve, and that's 10% of 1,000, so they can loan the balance or the difference, which is $900. Now, where does that money come from? Well, <laughs> same place. <laughs> it springs into being precisely at the point where the loan is made. It didn't exist before anywhere. Now notice the important thing here. The money that's created out of nothing and given to the government, the government spends for its purposes. But the money that's created out of nothing by the banks is not spent by the banks, it's loaned by the banks to you and to me, and we pay interest on it. Not too shabby. Interest on nothing. I wish I had a magic checkbook like that, or I didn't have to have any money, just a checkbook. And I could write checks, $10,000, $20,000, $100,000 all day long and loan them to you folks and you pay me interest on it, you see? Not too shabby at all. This in fact is the payoff to the commercial banks in the cartel. This scam has become legitimized by law. And we're told it's a wonderful thing. We think our banking system is wonderful. 
but it's a scam. Not only interest on nothing, but perpetual interest on nothing, because notice, once this money is created, if you pay it back, they have it on their ledger as a credit. They can loan it out again to somebody else, and the whole object is to keep loaned out. They don't, they don't like the money not loaned out because you can't earn interest on it. When it's in the ink well, it doesn't do them any good. So remember, there's nothing here except ink in the well or electronic impulses in the computer. That's all there is. So they're collecting interest on that. But that's not the end of the process. That is how money is created in America, but that's not the end of it because it has consequences. What impact does that have on us? Are we involved in this in any way? Well, yes, we are. I've heard people say, gee, those fellows are really smart. I guess they deserve to be rich. <laughs> you know? As though it didn't affect them in any way. Let's follow it. This money that's created out of nothing goes into the economy and it dilutes down the value of the dollars that were already out there. It's like pouring water into the pot of soup. It dilutes the <coughs> soup. And so the economy is diluted by these new dollars and prices start to go up or they appear to be going up. It's the process called inflation. I say appear to go up because prices really don't go up, ladies and gentlemen. What's happening is that the value of the dollar goes down. Right. That's what we're witnessing here. If we had a real monetary system, real money backed by gold or silver or anything of tangible value, coffee cups, anything that couldn't just be created out of nothing behind our money, you would find that the purchasing power of that money would remain constant over a long period of time. And to illustrate that point, it's interesting to know that if we had lived in ancient Rome and had a one ounce gold coin, we would have been able to buy a fine toga, a handcrafted belt, and a pair of sandals. That was the price. So today, what can we buy with a one ounce gold coin? We can walk into any men's store and buy a really fine suit, a handcrafted belt, and a pair of shoes. The real price of these items hasn't changed in thousands of years when expressed in terms of real money. But when expressed in terms of these things we carry around, we call them dollars, they're not. They're really Federal Reserve notes. They buy less and less and less because they keep creating more and more and more of them and they dilute the economic soup. But we still haven't followed this to the end of the trail. We've lost some purchasing power through this thing called inflation. But how many people ask the question, who gained it? Did anybody gain our lost purchasing power or did it just evaporate and go up to heaven somewhere? Somebody gained it, didn't they? But we don't know who. Let's follow it. The people who gained our lost purchasing power were those who were at the point where this fresh money was injected into the economic soup. Those at the nozzle get dollars that look the same as all the other dollars and they have them first and they can spend them at full purchasing power. But by the time the person who gets those dollars then gives them to the next person and the next person, it goes out toward the edge of the pot where most of us are, and it gets diluted down. But the ones up there at the nozzle are the ones who have gained our lost purchasing power. Who are they? Well, we know that the government is one of them. That's where the billion dollar check started, isn't it? That was the beginning of this whole process. The government spent that money first. And then, of course, those who work for the government and those who have government contracts and those who get grants and so forth get the next wave, and they're not doing too bad either, and it starts out from there. But what about on the banking side? Who got that money first off? Well, the people that came up to the loan window. They were the first ones to get it. Now, this is a, comes as no surprise to anybody here, I'm sure, that in times of inflation, it's a good thing to borrow. Everybody tells you that because you, you say, you know that you're going to borrow a dollar and you pay it back 
with quarters or 50 cent pieces because inflation erodes the value of those dollars. So you know to borrow is to gain. And the people who don't borrow, who save, they're the ones who are losing. But notice, however, that this gain that the borrower gets, he has to turn right around and give to the bank in the form of interest on nothing. So he doesn't really gain at all. It appears to be gain, it's paper gain, but his gain actually goes back to the bank as interest on nothing. Now, yes, during times of inflation, his paper assets expand, expand, expand. Golly, this real estate looks like it's worth a lot of money right now. But then the economy contracts, and he, he's wiped out. He doesn't have anything. And notice that when you go to the bank and you go to borrow some of this nothing money, did they expect nothing from you in return? No. They want you to sign over a, and pledge as collateral your car, your house, your assets, hard assets, not nothing assets. So when the economy contracts and you can't continue to make those payments, they get your marbles. So the bank will do all right, whether it's expansion or contraction. <coughs> So what's the answer to the question? Who gains? Who got your lost purchasing power? Big surprise, ladies and gentlemen. The two members of the partnership called the Federal Reserve System. It's the government and the members of the banking cartel. Those are the ones who got your purchasing power. Now there in a nutshell is an overview of the Federal Reserve System. And I guarantee you, ladies and gentlemen, you're not going to read this in any textbook on the subject. And I can also tell you that you now understand everything there is of importance to know about the Federal Reserve System. The payoff on the government side is that they're able to tax their people. And don't forget, inflation is a tax. You pay it, you have no escape. It's a hidden tax, but it's a tax just the same. And so the government is able to tax the people without them even knowing they're paying the tax. And on the banking cartel side, they're able to collect perpetual interest on nothing. Now that is the end of part one. Stand by. There's more. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a five minute break and let's keep it to that's it okay ladies and gentlemen I think this is uh Time for uh, continuation. Everyone refreshed? Anybody want to open up a bank? <laughs> All right, part two. We'll go back to Jekyll Island. We have much to learn there. In fact, if we just analyze what happened on Jekyll Island, we can figure out almost everything that's going on today, even though that happened back in 1910. And one of the things that they had to resolve there was what to call this creature of theirs. This partnership between government and the commercial banks was not new with the Federal Reserve System. In fact, it w this concept was created back in Europe in the 16th century. And it was perfected with the Bank of England in 1694. This is uh, the kind of thing from that date forward that all of the governments of Europe adopted. Now, they didn't call it a mandrake mechanism like I do. They called it a central bank. Now, that's the technical name for this partnership. If you want to look this process up in a textbook or an encyclopedia, you'll find it listed under central bank. So the central banks were created in Europe in the 16th century. And there's very good reason for that. The kings and the princes of Europe discovered from hard experience that they could raise the taxes of their subjects only so far 
and then there was a ceiling. They had a tax revolt on their hands. There was resistance, and they had real revolution or revolt on their hands, and they tended to lose their jobs <laughs> or their heads. <laughs> so that was it, folks. Forty percent, forty-three percent seems to have been the natural limit. However, once they got the central bank mechanism worked out, this was a whole new ball game. Now the lid was off, and they were able to collect 50 percent, 60, 70, and in some cases, 80 percent of everything that their subjects produced. And their subjects did not revolt, did not resent it even because they didn't know that they were paying this tax through a process called inflation. All they knew was that the prices were going out of sight, and they had no inkling that it was their government in combination with the private banks that were taxing them in this fashion. And so, see, this became a method of, of hidden taxation, which has continued to this day to be extremely popular with big spending governments. And so this became the modus operandi in in Europe from that date forward. Now, when they met on Jekyll Island, it was very clear in their mind that they were creating a central bank. But they had a problem, what to call it, because Congress was already on record as saying they did not want a central bank in America. I don't think the congressmen really understood what that meant, but they had heard the phrase and they knew that that's what they had in Europe. And they said, no, when it comes to banking reform in America, we want something that's unique to represent our unique political and economic system. So a central bank was out. So what to call this central bank so that no one will know? And they talked about this on Jekyll Island. And this is what they concluded. They said, first, let's use the word federal to make it seem like it's a government operation. Secondly, let's add the word reserve to make it seem like there are reserves somewhere, like it was a banking concept. Third, let's add the word system. And this was very important, far more than we might think today, because remember, the major concern was this concentration of financial power in New York. And they had to sell the American people on the idea that this was a diffusion of power over a system of banks. And so they talked about ten regional banks, and finally they said, no, that's not enough. We'll have twelve regional banks and diffuse the power away from New York, or at least make it appear that way. And they'll build those big buildings in all these regions, and the local yokels can come and look at the buildings and say, golly, we got one of them out here too. <laughs> and the impression was that because these buildings were out there, that the power was pulled away from New York and diffused throughout a system of Federal Reserve Banks. Well, as you've heard said many times by now, what we wound up with was not federal, there are no reserves, it's not a system at all in the sense of diffusion of power, and the Federal Reserve Banks aren't even banks. So on all four words, we're dealing with appearances of the fourth kind. Brilliant strategy. The next step was to sell this creature to the American people. And the first draft of the Federal Reserve Act was called the Aldridge Bill, sponsored by Senator Aldridge, of course. And this was against the good advice of Paul Warburg, who said, Nelson, if you put your name on this bill, it's going to get voted down in Congress because you are so closely identified with the, uh, with the power of big business. It'll be voted down. And apparently, Aldrich's ego was too big. He must have said, well, no, after all, I'm respected in the Senate, and I am the chairman of the National Monetary Commission. And for whatever reason, he insisted on having his name on it. I think he wanted to go down in history as the originator of the Federal Reserve System. But Warburg was right. Voted down, thumbs down right away, because he was a representative of big business. Well, this was a minor setback. They took their bill, they scrambled the paragraphs around a little bit, they took Aldridge's name off of it, and found a couple of Democrats to sponsor the bill. Now, this was different. See, Aldridge was a Republican, 
And everyone knew that the Republicans represented big business. But they also knew that the Democrats represented the common man, the little guy, the fellow on the assembly line, you know, like Ted Kennedy. <laughs> So they found a couple of millionaire Democrats to sponsor the bill. They got Carter Glass from the House and uh, Senator Robert Owen, who was a very successful banker. And now they sponsored the bill. It was the Glass-Owen bill, and this was different. This was a Democrat bill, and it began to receive very popular consideration in Congress. Next, Aldridge and Vanderlip began to give speeches and statements to the press condemning the bill that they had written. They said, this will ruin the banks. This will be terrible for the nation. And by the time this was printed in the newspapers, the average person read that and said, oh, I guess the big bankers don't like this bill very much. It must be pretty good. <laughs> you know, you have to give these people credit. They, weren't, they were not stupid. They didn't get to be where they were through stupidity. They understood mass psychology, they understood politics, and they played their cards exceedingly well. Next, the same individuals who were condemning the bill were privately financing it. They were behind the, all the lobbying activities in Washington. They personally paid for the creation of what was called grassroots study clubs that came up all over the country, held public meetings, and disseminated brochures extolling the virtue of the Federal Reserve Act. They gave large amounts of money to some of the better known universities and created new departments of economics, handpicked their own people to be the professors to chair those departments, and then those men began to speak publicly and write scholarly essays about how wonderful the Federal Reserve System was. And then, at the insistence of Paul Warburg, who was always the master strategist in this, they added several good provisions to the act. When I say good, I mean provisions which restricted the power of the Federal Reserve System to create money out of nothing. The kind of provisions you and I might have endorsed. And Warburg's associates said, Paul, what are you doing? We don't want those things in there. This is our bill. And his response was classic. He said, relax, fellows, don't you get it? Our object here is to get the bill passed. We can fix it up later. That's exactly what he said. When no one is looking, everyone is focusing on the bill now. Let's get it in fix it up later, and indeed he was right. It was because of provisions such as those that they won over the support of William Jennings Bryan, who was the leader of the populist movement, a real defender of the common man, in his mind at least. He looked at that bill, and previously he had opposed it because he said it was the bill of the bankers. They would create money out of nothing, he said. And he looked at those provisions and he said, oh, well, I guess with those in there, I can support the bill. And with the elimination of his opposition, the road was cleared, and it was inevitable what would happen. They did fix it up later. Since the Federal Reserve Act was passed, it has been amended over a hundred times, and nobody has noticed. All of those original provisions, which were sound, were long ago removed, and many, many more have been added, which greatly expand the power and reach of the Federal Reserve System. A big bunch was added back in 1980. It just extends the power of the federal government to areas that you can't even imagine. We're talking previously about being able to create money out of government debt, American government debt. They can now create it out of foreign debt. Any country in the world, any country in the world can offer a bond an IOU, and our Federal Reserve System is now empowered by law to convert that into American money. Even corporate debt, they can convert that into American money. No, there's no limit whatsoever, and nobody has noticed. So Warburg was right. They fixed it up later. And it's no, surprising, therefore, no surprise, therefore, that with this kind of professional 
deception and strategy that a great deal of support was gained for the bill and on december twenty second nineteen thirteen it was passed into law and signed into law the next day by president wilson and the creature from jekyll island finally moved into washington d c well what did we get let's stand back from the creature now a few paces and and survey its general form we got a corporation chartered by congress which was given an exclusive franchise to create the nation's money. We got a mechanism whereby Congress has been able to raise unlimited amounts of taxes through inflation without the American people even knowing that they're paying the tax. And we got a mechanism whereby the banks can earn perpetual interest on nothing. I'd like to turn our attention now to an intriguing question, which is, who owns the Federal Reserve System? You often hear this topic discussed on talk radio. Whenever the subject of money or the Federal Reserve comes up, inevitably, somebody will get on the telephone and say, did you know that the Federal Reserve System is not a government agency at all? It's a private corporation. It's run by the private banks. And what we need to do, they'll say, is to abolish the, uh, abolish the Fed and turn it over to Congress so it can be run for the benefit of the people. Well, I'd like to deal with that because we're <laughs> this involves uh, a half-truth and a non-solution. Let's start with a half-truth first. It is true that the Federal Reserve System is not an agency of the, of the federal government. As I mentioned before, it is a corporation chartered by Congress. And like all corporations, it has stock certificates. And these certificates are held, in this case, by the member banks within the system. All the banks, remember this is a cartel, independently owned banks make up this system. They hold the stock certificates. All right. Now up to that point, it looks as though this has all the attributes of a privately held corporation. But that's as far as it goes because these stock certificates do not carry with them any of the powers of private ownership. For example, the holders of these stock certificates cannot sell them. Well, if you can't sell something, you don't really own it, because that's one of the tests of ownership, is your freedom to dispose of it in any way you wish. Also, the larger banks have put up more capital into the system than the smaller banks. It's not a lot of money, but it's related to their assets. The larger banks put up more, have more stock certificates than the smaller banks. And yet, regardless of that, all of the banks have one vote. So there's another violation of the principle of private ownership. Furthermore, that vote doesn't buy anything of substance. These banks cannot vote for their national management. The Federal Reserve System is run by the Board of Directors of the Federal Reserve System, the National Board and its chairman, all of whom are appointed by the President. The stock certificate holders have no voice in that whatsoever. The only thing they can vote for are the members of the board of their local regional banks, so-called banks. But guess what? The chairman and the vice chairman of those regional banks are appointed by the national board. Guess what? They can vote for their officers of the regional banks, but they can be overridden. The national board has veto power over those people. You get the picture here? In spite of this sales job of this diffusion of power over the 12 regional banks, these banks have no power at all. It's all concentrated in the national board. The only thing that the regional banks can do, according to their charters, of any substance, is to set the interest rates within their regions. But guess what? Even that is subject to veto by the national board. So you come to the conclusion that these people at the National Board are not authorized to do anything except play golf. 
See, that's the way it was designed. This fiction of this diffusion of power throughout the system was just to sell it to the American people in 1913. It's a vestige. It serves no function whatsoever today at all and was never designed to. So we don't have a corporation in the strict sense of the word, a privately held corporation. And we don't have a government agency in the strict sense of the word. So what do we have? Well, the fact is we have hybrid. It's a mixture. It's half government and it's half private. It is, in fact, exactly what you would expect it to be, considering that it is a partnership between the government and a private cartel. It's half government and it's half private. So this structure is unique to reflect its unique form. But this isn't so important as to who owns it, how many shares of stock, and what the voting is. The question is, what does it do? Insofar as merely abolishing the Fed, as mon some people have said, many people have said, abolish the Fed and turn it over to the Treasury or turn it over to the Congress so it can be run for the benefit of the people. Always, always make sure you say it's for the people and that makes it okay. It would do the same thing over there that it does over here. It's not a question of who owns it, it's what does it do, and as long as it is a central bank, which means as long as it has the power and the mandate to create out of money out of nothing, that's what it's going to do. It's going to create money out of nothing, and I'm sure the same people will run it over there that run it over here. We must remember that all of the central banks of Europe are in fact direct agencies of their respective governments. They are not these hybrid organizations over there that they are here because there was no necessity to create that myth over there. They just went right for it. It's an agency of the government over there. And they all do exactly the same thing as our Federal Reserve System does here. So you see, just turning it over to Congress without taking away its power to create money out of nothing is a non-solution. And I'm sure that the people who run this would, would be willing to use the same kind of deception they did back when it was created. They would pretend to resist that idea. They would fight it with all of their might, at least in public, knowing that they could yield on that and have it turned over to the Congress and they'd still have control over it. Over it. So that is a non-solution. I'd like to talk now about what the objectives of the Federal Reserve System are, because if we're going to say it's going to, if it were turned over to Congress, it would pursue the same agenda. What is that agenda? Extremely important thing to focus on, because we're told that the purpose of the Fed is to stabilize the economy. And everybody kind of believes that. <laughs> I mean, when Greenspan comes on and says, well, we're raising interest rates now, why? To stabilize the economy, right? To prevent inflation. In other words, to protect you folks. To protect you. And we buy it. Well, one of the most uh, widely used textbooks in our schools right now, textbook on economics written by Paul Samuelson, explains it this way. It says, quote, the Federal Reserve sprang from the panic of 1907 with its alarming epidemic of bank failures. The country was fed up once and for all with the anarchy of unstable private banking. It's partly true. It's just they came up with the wrong solution. Just because there's a problem doesn't mean that any old solution that somebody has to offer is the best. In fact, it may be a non-solution. So we were talking about just turning the system over to the government to run is a non-solution. Well, let's take a look at this. If the purpose of the Federal Reserve System is to stabilize the economy, let's give it a report card and see how well it's done. Since it was formed, it has presided over the crashes of 1921 and 1929, the Great Depression of 29 through 39, Recessions in the years 53, 57, 69, 75, and 81. A stock market Black Monday in 87. We all know that corporate debt is soaring. Personal debt is greater than ever before. 
both business and personal bankruptcies are at an all-time high. Banks and savings and loan associations have failed at a rate greater than ever before in our history. Interest on the national debt is now consuming half of all of our taxes. Heavy industry has been largely replaced by overseas competition. We're facing an international trade deficit for the first time in our history. 75% of downtown Los Angeles and other large metropolitan areas are now owned by foreigners and over half of the nation right now is officially in a state of recession. Now that is the report card of the Federal Reserve System after 80 years of stabilizing the economy. <laughs> and I don't think it's even controversial to say that the Federal Reserve has failed to meet its stated objectives. The only controversial question is why has it failed? And my answer to that is because those have never been its true objectives at all. What are its true <laughs> objectives? Well, what are the objectives of any cartel? Make to make money, to enhance the profit margins of the members of the cartel, and to stabilize its position in the marketplace, to prevent competition. Those are the objectives of any cartel. And if our analysis is correct here, we'll find that this, in fact, has been what the Federal Reserve System has accomplished for itself and its component members. To be more specific, it's possible to go to the period of Jekyll Island and read the papers and speeches that were done by the people on Jekyll Island and their associates. The big banks were concerned over three things, among other things, but the three main things were as follows. They said they wanted to reverse the erosion of their power away from New York. That's right, just the opposite of what the Federal Reserve System was supposed to accomplish, they wanted to keep it in New York. They were concerned because as the nation was spreading westward and southward, new banks were springing up all over the frontier, and more and more of the capital assets of the nation were moving in that direction. Yes, they still had the lion's share, but every year the percentages went down a little bit and they could see where that chart was going. And they said, we must put a stop to this now while we still have power. Remember, John D. Rockefeller said it, competition is a sin. And competition from the new banks in America was something that had to be stopped. See, one of the purposes of the Federal Reserve System was to control the competition from the new banks. And this is a good place to emphasize that when I'm talking about the cartel, I'm primarily talking about the big banks in New York that created it, and the international banks as well, the ones in Europe. I'm not talking about your bank down the street that ever since the system was created has struggled and struggled under the regulations of the system which were designed primarily to some extent to squeeze the competition out or to keep it in its place. And you've seen that process going on throughout the years. We have fewer and fewer banks all the time, little ones getting gobbled up by, by the big banks. So that was uh, objective number one. Number two, they wanted to reverse the trend of what is called private capital formation. Now, what that means is simply this. It means that people in those days were using their own savings instead of going to the bank and borrowing. Corporations in particular found that it was better for them to withhold some of the dividends from their stockholders each quarter, put that money into a sinking fund, let it accumulate, or let the capital form, as they say, capital formation, and then use their own money to build the new factory or launch a research and development project or whatever, instead of going to the banks. And the banks were extremely concerned over this trend. They rack their brains. How do we get businesses to come back to the banks and borrow money again? And their answer was quite simple. If you were a banker, you would know how to do that. The answer is to lower interest rates. To make those rates so attractive that you'd be crazy not to go to the bank and borrow the money at those interest rates. It's so much easier than saving. Well, why didn't they just lower interest rates? because that was 1913, ladies and gentlemen, and they couldn't. 
Money was real money in those days. It was backed by gold and silver. There was no lever on it. No man, no group of men, no politicians, no bankers could arbitrarily affect interest rates. Because it was backed by gold and silver, the money was, and they couldn't just create it out of nothing. You see, under those conditions, interest rates are the product of the forces of supply and demand in a free market economy. Nobody has control over it. And that's why the politicians hate money that's backed by gold and silver. They cannot manipulate it. So their challenge was, how can we artificially depress the interest rates below the natural level that's produced in the free market? And the solution was, they said, the nation needed what was called a flexible currency. They said, this is what industry needed to prosper, a flexible currency. You still hear that phrase today, the virtues of a flexible currency. Well, what is a flexible currency? You need a dictionary. Well, it's not paper money that folds. <laughs> what that means is money created out of nothing. That's what a flexible currency is. See, the trick is not particularly hard to figure out here. If you are creating money out of nothing, you don't have to charge an awful lot of interest on it to show a profit. <laughs> See, it's as simple as that. So with a flexible currency, now they have a lever on it. And they can jack the interest rates down, 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 so that it's attractive. And they're still making plenty of profit on it because it didn't cost them anything. And they have reversed the trend toward private capital formation. And the third objective that they spoke about in those days was how to pass on the inevitable losses within the banking system, to pass those losses on to the taxpayer in the name of protecting the people. Now, let's give the Federal Reserve System another report card with these objectives in mind and see how well it has done. Did they keep control over the banking system and the monetary system in New York? And yes, they did. Anyone who knows how the markets function, it has always remained in New York. In fact, it's even more so now in New York than it was then. Yes, there are plenty of large banks in the nation, in the South and in the West, but these are small compared to those giants that are in New York, in fact, that are astride the world, with offices in Peking and Moscow and Africa, everywhere in the world, the giants are in New York. And they have been running the show all of these years. A few years ago, there was a book that appeared on the market called Secrets of the Temple, written by William Greider and published by Simon & Schuster. It was a bestseller. And it was advertised as a scathing attack against the Federal Reserve System. But when I heard that, I could hardly believe my eyes and my ears a scathing attack against the Federal Reserve System, published by Simon and Schuster? Now, this is one of the biggies. I thought to myself, well, a miracle has happened. I guess I don't have to finish my book because it's done. Somebody did it. So I ran down and I got a copy of the book and I went through it and I was amazed at what I found on two points. First of all, I was amazed because Greider had his history very well done indeed. It was accurate. I didn't expect that. I thought it might be a whitewash of some kind, but it wasn't. It was very good. I knew about this because I was right then in the process of researching it, and Greider had it. And on this point of the concentration of power in New York, I'd like to read to you just a couple of sentences from his best-selling book. He's talking about 1913 here, and he said, at the time, the conventional wisdom in Congress was that the government institution would finally harness the money trust, disarm its powers, and establish broad democratic control over money and credit. The results were nearly the opposite. The money reforms enacted in 1913, in fact, helped to preserve the status quo, to stabilize the old order. Money center bankers would not only gain dominance over the new central bank, but would also enjoy new insulation against instability and their own decline. Once the Fed was in operation, the steady diffusion of financial power halted. Wall Street maintained its dominant position and even enhanced it. 
which is true. Now, the second thing that amazed me about his book was his conclusion. After demonstrating that the Federal Reserve System had always acted against the public interest and that it was designed to do that from the beginning, what do you suppose his conclusion was regarding what we should do about it? Abolish the Fed? No, no, nothing, nothing that extreme. Well, how about a major overhaul? No, no, not necessary. He said, you see, folks, it's all so complicated. But we're learning as we go, and we're getting better at it. Relax, everything's under control. All we need now are wiser men. <laughs> well, there you have an interesting situation. You see, that's the kind of powder puff solution that it takes to be published by Simon & Schuster or any of the other major publishing houses which are firmly locked into the financial web of the money trust in Wall Street. There's no way in the world that these major media outlets are going to allow anybody to come up with a real solution to the problem. Now, I need to digress here just for a second because we have a lot to learn from this. Not just in the field of the Federal Reserve System, but in many other areas of concern to our nation in these critical days ahead. It's not enough just to point with alarm. It's not enough just to say, well, this is historically true, and it's not enough to lead the charge if you don't lead it anywhere. See, these people don't care how much you expose their, their scams or their conspiracies or their plots if you have no solution. If your only solution is, well, now I told you about it, for now just vote Republican, you know? <laughs> if that's it, nothing's going to happen, is it? Until we look behind party labels. And, in other words, wiser men, okay? whatever that means. This is controlled opposition, ladies and gentlemen, and it's something that's been going on for a long time. These people are smart enough. Remember, they sold this Federal Reserve System in the face of opposition, and they did it by deception. They're smart enough to control their own opposition or to create their own opposition if necessary so they can lead it nowhere. <coughs> I'll just leave that thought with you because it's something we need to be very aware of in the critical days ahead. Let's get back to the Federal Reserve. It gets an A on its report card for objective number one which is to maintain control over the money markets in New York. Did they reverse the trend toward private capital formation? Boy, did they ever. With interest rates brought down periodically to such attractive levels, individuals and corporations have been enticed away from saving their own money and going to the bank. You'd be a fool not to get that money at those low interest rates. Of course, then the economy contracts and things go a little sour now and then, and the fruit falls from the tree, and they pick it up. They get all your marbles. They get all your assets, your houses, your cars, your factories, your stocks, and your bonds. That's one of the reasons we've had so many bankruptcies in the decades past. Even those companies today, which are hanging in there by the skin of their teeth, <coughs> because it's all they can do to make payments, to service their debt to the banks. Notice that many of those companies are now sending more money to the banks as interest on their loans than they send to their stockholders as dividends on their stocks. Think about that. The banks which created the money out of nothing, no effort at all, no risk really of anything, are making more money out of these giant industries than the people who worked for the money, sacrificed, saved the money, invested it, and risked it. And yet the money is going to the banks. Yes, the Federal Reserve System, in fact, gets an A on its report card for reversing the trend toward private capital formation, and they did it with a flexible currency, just as they had planned to do it. <coughs> And what about the third objective, which was to pass the losses on to the taxpayers in the name of protecting the people? That is something which I call in my book Operation Bailout, a game called Bailout. You may have noticed every time a large bank gets into trouble, not the small banks, they're dispensable. 
The large banks, when they get into trouble, they're going to be bailed out by the government, which means by your tax dollars and mine, in the name of protecting the people. It doesn't make any difference if, there's a, it's a, if it's a private corporation uh, or a city municipality or a third world country, whoever has borrowed megabucks from these banks and now can't service their debt anymore, they have trouble making those interest payments, which is all banks care about. They don't want you to pay back the loan because they have then just the problem of finding somebody else to lend it to. They don't want you to pay back your loan. They want you to pay the interest on the loan and keep those loans going forever. And finally, when people have trouble making those interest payments, and it looks like the bank is going to have to write it off of its books, what happens? They go to Congress. And they say, well, this corporation that's having trouble making its interest payments, we can't let that corporation fold because look how many thousands of jobs would be lost and people would go on welfare. There would be despair. We must protect the people. Or if it's a third world country that can't make its interest payments anymore. And they say, well, we can't allow that to happen. We must make those payments for them in some way or another. Because if that venerable bank had to write that huge loan off of its books, it would technically be bankrupt. And if it were bankrupt, it might have to close its doors. If that bank were to fall, it's such a huge bank, it'd be like a domino and it might knock the other banks down too. And we could have a major economic crisis on our hands and look how the people would suffer. And so Congress dutifully always responds. Remember, Congress is the partner in this scam always rushes in and says, yes, we can't allow those bad things to happen to the people. And so they vote the money to guarantee the loans or make outright payments in some very creative fashions so that the interest can continue flowing to the banks. Some of the more memorable games you may have missed over the recent years, Penn Central Railroad was bailed out in 1970, Lockheed Corporation that same year, Commonwealth Bank of Detroit in 1972, New York City in 1975, Chrysler in 1978, First Pennsylvania Bank in 1980, Continental Illinois, the largest of the banks so far, in 1982, and of course we know how many third world countries out there have had their debts funded. The money comes from the IMF World Bank so they can continue making their payments and the IMF World Bank gets their money from the Federal Reserve System, and the Federal Reserve System gets it from us in the form of that mandrake mechanism and the hidden tax called inflation, or direct taxes in some cases. <coughs> the Federal Reserve System gets an A on its report card on all three of its true objectives. My final topic is a short one and it has to do with usury. An interesting concept. Usury used to be defined in ancient times as interest on a loan, period. Any interest on any loan was usury. Well, it's been redefined in modern times as excessive interest on a loan in view of the fact that when people earn their money and they save it, they sacrifice the use of it and then they loan it to somebody else for their venture, they're entitled to some reasonable return on that sacrifice. Some interest return uh, is, it seems fair and logical to most people. So the question today is excessive interest. What is that? It was Thomas Edison who said, people who will not turn a shovel full of dirt on the project, nor contribute a pound of materials, will collect more money than will the people who will supply all the materials and do all the work. When I read that, I wondered if that was true. I took my calculator and I ran the numbers. You might try this sometime. If you assume a $100,000 home to be built and the $30,000 is to go for the land and the architect's fees and the building permits, that kind of thing, $70,000 to go for the actual construction of the house materials and the labor. You assume further that the buyer goes to the bank, puts 20% down, takes out a 10% loan for 30 years, punch in the numbers, and you will see that he will pay to the bank in interest $172,741 compared to $70,000 
for labor and materials. In other words, as Edison said, two and a half times more will be paid to the banks who did nothing than for those who provided all the labor and all of the materials. And you may say, well, yet yeah, that's true, but don't forget the time value of money. Reasonable interest is rational. People need to be compensated for the sacrifice of their money over 30 years. That's a long period of time. <coughs> Wait a minute. Not this money, ladies and gentlemen. Nobody earned this money. Nobody saved this money. Nobody sacrificed anything for this money. This money was created out of nothing. And I suggest that $172,741 interest on nothing is excessive. <laughs> I think we need to focus on this issue. We need a new definition of the word usury. Any interest on any loan of fiat money, meaning money created out of nothing. Now this example of $172,741 unearned interest on a $100,000 home is like a grain of sand in the Sahara. Look around the desert. All of the other homes of America, all of the factories, all the machinery in the factories, all of the high-rise buildings, the the hotels, all the airplanes, the automobiles, the farm equipment, the farm structures, everything that we have. You were looking at a similar relationship here. This is staggering to consider the amount of money that is in this huge wide river of wealth flowing into the banking cartel because the money was created out of nothing. It's such a wide river of wealth, you can't even think across it in your mind. It's perpetually moving into the banking cartel. This is a dead short across the productive capacity of America. This is money that should be going to the people who produce and who create instead of being siphoned off through a scam. Think of what our standard of living could be if it weren't for this dead short across our economy. Well, where is this money going, this river? Where is it flowing? You get the mental picture that maybe it's going into a, a lake somewhere or a, behind a dam. All this money is uh, rising, accumulating. People are getting richer and richer and richer. No, not so. It's not how it works. They're spending the money. <coughs> what are they spending it for? Well, they're not spending it for more yachts and more, yan uh, more mansions. That's not it. I mean, they got rid of the mansions back on Jekyll Island. They got bored with those things. Once a person has all the money that they can possibly use for the material pleasures of life, what is left? Sure, power. Absolutely. They are spending this money for power, ladies and gentlemen, to acquire power over you and me and our children. They're literally buying up the world with it. But I don't mean they're buying up the real estate or the hardware. They're buying up control over people. Technically, in sociological terms, they're buying control over the power centers, which means those groups and institutions through which people live and work and follow leadership and accept information. People are always associated in groups, and they work in groups, they move in groups. And these groups have heads of them, leaders. And this money has been going for many years to acquire influence, if not control, over the leaders of these power centers in society. So they can therefore indirectly influence and control you and me. Specifically, that means they have been spending this river of wealth very freely 
to buy control over politicians, political parties, television networks, cable networks, newspapers, magazines, publishers, wire services, motion picture studios, universities, labor unions, church organizations, trade associations, labor unions, tax-exempt foundations, multinational corporations, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, you name it. Make your own list. I guarantee you, if you have a large, influential organization, which influences people, you will find that this river of wealth has been flowing partly into a, an attempt to acquire control over the leadership of these institutions and organizations. Especially those which are offered as opposition. Especially those which supposedly are to stop this whole process from happening. Now, this has not only been going on in America, but this has been going on in every nation of the world, pretty much in the industrialized nations as it has gone on here. But I'd like to call your attention to what's been happening in the so-called third world or the underdeveloped nations. This process <coughs> is now complete. It's not going on. It's finished. They literally have bought those nations. Have you ever wondered what's going on there with the IMF World Bank? Every once in a while on the back page of the newspaper, you read that Congress once again authorized another hundred billion dollars or so to go to the World Bank. And then it explains very carefully that this money is being used for humanitarian reasons. It's being used to uplift the standard of living of these poor people. That is an appearance of the fourth kind if you ever saw one. It's not being used for that at all. If it is, they're not doing a very good job because after all these years, you cannot point to one of those countries which has had its standard of living raised one iota by this vast expenditure of money because it was never designed to do that. The money does not go to the people. It does not go to the industries or the businesses of those countries where it might have a chance of raising the standard of living. It goes to the politicians, doesn't it? It goes to the governments of those countries and it is used specifically to to perfect and strengthen the control mechanisms over their people. Usually this starts out, uh, starts out as an inefficient dictatorship, but by the time they get the UN money, it ends up as an efficient dictatorship. They have a better organized and equipped army. They have a better paid bureaucracy, more people in the bureaucracy. They have more ways of controlling their subjects. They have food chains that they can offer to their friends and deny it to their enemies. This money is used to build totalitarian systems in every country that you want to point to and analyze. You see, these people, these leaders of these countries, for the most part, couldn't care less about the standard of living of their subjects as long as they live well. They live in their mansions, have their yachts, their jet air aircraft, and they go to New York and live in the Waldorf Astoria while they attend United Nations meetings. They're very happy with that. They have no ideology. Communism, socialism, fascism, capitalism, what difference does it make? Where's the money? That's it with these people. We know how welfare families in this country can be second, third generation families and there's no hope at all of getting them off the dole because they can't imagine any other way of life. This happens at the international stage, too. We're dealing with countries now that are second, third, in some cases, fourth generation welfare governments. They don't know how to survive unless that money comes free through the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank means from us. There's no way in the world they're going to break free from that. These countries, ladies and gentlemen, have already been purchased, lock, stock, and barrel in this fashion, and they are now in place in the new world order. And they're simply waiting for us to show up. And that's the other side of the coin, because not only does this transfer of wealth to these countries from us not raise their standard of living, but it does in fact help to lower ours. And this too is part of the plan. A strong nation is not a candidate for surrendering its sovereignty. But if a nation can be brought to its knees, if it is hungry, desperate, if it has chaos on its street, in its streets, if it has political turmoil, then the people in that nation will 
much more likely accept any solution that's offered to them by their government or by a world government. If there's anarchy in the streets, as we saw in Watts, in Los Angeles, people were joyous when the soldiers showed up. They were joyous because this now was an end to anarchy. It was a dress rehearsal. They won't care whether the helmets on these people are blue or brown. If it says UN on the side, they won't, that won't make any difference. They'll say, thank God for the UN finally brought and restored peace to our streets. And if people are hungry and they're out of work and they, they don't know what to do in the economy, they'll be so thankful for a UN monetary unit which has purchasing power a little bit. Thank God for this UN money because the old American dollars are kaput. Don't know what to do with it. This is the plan, ladies and gentlemen, to weaken America. And so that's the process. And I'm mentioning this because I want to emphasize to you that what is going on here is, has nothing at all to do with wealth. The name of the game now is power. Well, now, what are we going to do about this? Obviously, if we just restrict our attention to the subject which is ours tonight, the Federal Reserve System, the answer is clear. We have to slay the creature, but how are we going to do that? The creature was created by Congress, and that's how it's going to be slain. Congress can do it and will do it if we build enough fire under those chairs in Washington. I think it was Clyde Watts, General Clyde Watts years ago said, he was speaking of judges in those days, but he could have well, as well as talked about congressmen. He said, they may not see the light, but they can feel the heat. <laughs> and this is true. I don't know if you folks know, well, I know many of you folks here know all about the trim committees, which are part of the John Burt Society. They have proven themselves to be excellent ways of getting some of these big spenders out of Congress. It just happened. We saw, but I think it was 30 of them replaced, not entirely because of trim activity, but believe me, it had a lot to do with it. This is something that works. And even those that, uh, that didn't come up, that didn't get replaced, uh, they're having their voting records changed. I don't, have the, I don't have the name here, unfortunately, but I heard just the other day there was some congressman we, we had the letters shown to us there. Here was a guy with his voting record. Was, it was very bad. He was voting for big government and, and higher taxes. And the trim committee started to hand out his trim bulletins in his district. And it was at a gun show. And he came over and says, take those things off the table. And he was irate. He said, well, we can't do that, Congressman. That's your report card. You know? <laughs> and he wrote a real nasty letter or two. And they had copies of it. And he said, you know, I think that these trim bulletins are good for one thing. And that's to line the bottom of the birdcage. That's what he said. The next election, his report card was all good. <laughs> he decided, I can't get rid of these trim bulletins. He's changed his voting, and the next report card was good. He straightened out. He had no particular principles, but these fellows put their finger to the wind, and they can tell which way it's blowing. If he wanted to be reelected, he had to get into, into step. And I know that a lot of these people go around saying, well, I've been trying to warn my constituents of this danger for many years, once the fire is built under their seat. So that is a very important program, and we can do it simply by exposing the voting records of these people and not just taking their words. Now, all of this, of course, this whole program requires an informed electorate, and that doesn't just happen. You don't inform the electorate just by wanting it to happen. You have to have quality educational materials. You have to know that they're accurate. You have to be able to rely on them. You have to have an organization to prepare and distribute these materials, they just don't go out on their own. I mean, I could have written this book, for example, and it would have just stacked up in my garage without the Speakers Committee, without the Birch Society, the Birch Society's programs and its chapters and its people in place, its coordinators. It takes organization to make these things happen. And of course, not, not the least of which it takes leadership which has proven its ability and its expertise, particularly its integrity, so it can offer real solutions instead of non-solutions and leadership which is not going to be purchased and run by the opposition. 
And of course, that is the mission of the John Birch Society. If there's anybody here who's not a member yet, I just want to tell you that the Society is an ideological army, and the time has come to enlist. I think it was uh, Patrick Henry who put it pretty well. He said, our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? Now, the bad news is that time is running out. It used to be that I told people that about some of these problems, and they would say to me, oh, it could never happen in America. You're just exaggerating, you know? And now they say, how much time do you think we have left? Because you can see it. It's all around us. The new world order is being built around us. We have a, a world army being built, a world court being built, a world taxing authority being built, a world trading authority being built. It's being built all around us. You realize right now as we speak, over half of our standing military is now serving under foreign officers. This thing is going rapidly, ladies and gentlemen. So we're running out of time. But the good news is we still have time. We still have time and we have the freedom to work. We can do it if we'll work like the Dickens, like our freedom and our lives depended upon it. They do. That's precisely what does depend on it. So instead of being sour about how late the hour is, we should rejoice over the fact that we still have freedom. We still can meet like this. We can hold public meetings. We still have elections. We can still throw these scoundrels out. So what we need to do now is just get to work and do that which we must do. We can still overthrow the government of the United States every two years without firing a single shot if we'll simply discharge the responsibility of citizenship which comes along with being free men. So that's my message with you, ladies and gentlemen, and that is that whatever it is you plan to do for your freedom or your country, do it now. And a good place to begin is to send Epictetus back to Phrygia, and let's convert that mammoth appearance of the fourth kind into a disappearance of the first kind. Thank you. Thank you.